All right, thanks for tuning in for part two. Irrigation is also, if not done properly, can lead to soil degradation. Let's take a look at some of that. First of all, definition for irrigation, the artificial provision or acquisition of water to support agriculture. 70% of all fresh water used by humans is used for irrigation. That is a big number, and I want you to keep that number in mind as we go into our study of um, water in a couple of units. Irrigated land globally covers more area than all of Mexico and Central America combined. And irrigation has boosted productivity in many places, but too much can cause problems. Here's one problem, water logging. It's the over-irrigation that can raise the water table high enough to suffocate plant roots with, wa with water logging. Um, so raising the water table, this is groundwater that has gotten so high that the water table, the top of the groundwater, is at the surface. And so plant roots are suffocated, they don't get the oxygen they need, and um, plants can die. Salinization is the buildup of salts in surface soil layers, and it's a widespread, widespread problem. So you see this is soil with this white crusty stuff. These are minerals. These are minerals and salts are another term for minerals. And so, um, you know, think about how if you were to take tap water or salt water from the sea, and um, if you were to put it in a little cup and then boil it off, what you're going to left, be left with at the bottom is this mineral, um, you know, this film of minerals. And that's, those are minerals that were dissolved in the water. These minerals are also dissolved in soil as soil minerals. But what can happen is evaporation in arid areas can draw water up through the soil, bringing salt with it. So just by putting irrigation water at the surface and allowing it to evaporation, evaporate, the process of evaporation can, um, can actually pull water from deeper in the soil up to the surface, bringing with it these salts. And repeated irrigation can cause repeated evaporation and more salts to the surface. So what do you do? How do you prevent this? Well, you have a couple of ways. Don't plant crops that need a lot of irrigation. That's one thing. Or irrigate with water that is low in salt content. Because some of those salts were not, um, some of those salts were not inherently present in the soil to begin with. Some of those salts are brought in from the water, which contains salts. And so as that water evaporates, it leaves behind salts of its own, and it's also bringing up salts from lower, deeper in the soil. So irrigate with water that's low in salt content. Irrigate efficiently using only as much water as necessary. These three things can help prevent salinization. So let's take a look at improving irrigation. At the top here, we see conventional irrigation, where only 43% of the water reaches the plants. What happens to the other 57%? A lot of it gets evaporated even before it hits um, the plants, gets carried away by wind, or um, might land on the leaves of the plants and then evaporates, whereas it's really the roots of the plant that need to have that water. So a more efficient way is drip irrigation, which is targeted to plants and it conserves water, saves money, and reduces problems like salinization. So you have a little, you have um, these uh, drip lines. These are like black tubes or pipes with little holes in them that water just drips out of. And so that dripping can go right on the soil. If you look at the soil down here, it's a little bit darker. Uh, let's see here, my cursor. So down here, and um, that can help keep the soil really moist and keep the roots in it happy. What if salinization has happened? Can you reverse it? One thing you can do is wait for rain to flush away the salts. You can also plant salt tolerant plants. And part of modern agriculture is coming up with common or common crops varieties that are more salt tolerant. You can also flush the soil with large quantities of less saline water, water that is um, less salty. Um, but this can lead to water logging like, the, like we already saw can be a problem. So um, next topic here, let's take a look at fertilizers. We know they supply nutrients to crops, that's why we use them. There are two classes, inorganic fertilizers, which are mined like the, like the phosphorus we spoke about, or synthetically manufactured mineral supplements, and, um, and also organic fertilizers coming from animal manure, crop residues, compost, etc. Um, along the line with that inorganic fertilizer would be those, um, the nitrification that we do in the chemical factory with the Haber-Bosch process, 
From that, we make ammonium nitrate, and then we, we build that into fertilizer pellets that we might apply, or fertilizer um, solution we might apply to a field. Organic fertilizers are better because they improve soil structure, nutrient retention, and water retention. Global fertilization or fertilizer use has risen dramatically in the past 50 years. We've seen this graph before when we spoke about eutrophication. Total fertilizer use has, I mean, you know, what can you say? It's gone from near zero in 1960 to, um, let's see here, 150 millions of metric tons applied. That's probably per year. And, um, and you can see it kind of stabilize, stabilize a little bit. This, um, this can lead to fertilizer runoff. So if you take a look at this diagram here, you have your tractor applying inorganic fertilizer, which includes phosphates and ammonia and ammonium and nitrates, all things that can lead to eutrophication. So um, with, uh, with this fertilizer that you're applying, in this case you're applying it in liquid form, some of it's going to evaporate, bringing nitrogen oxides into the air. Nitrogen oxides are a form of air pollution, and they can also um, act as a greenhouse gas, and that also, to some degree, can, um, can cause acid rain. So that's not good. Some of those uh, fertilizers can also infiltrate into the groundwater. Now you have contaminated groundwater. You see the little green dots compared to the blue dots. And once you have contaminated groundwater, that can be a very tricky thing to, to, um, to clear up. Because usually the residence time for this water is pretty high. When you dig a well and you tap into that water, oftentimes that water is water that's been in there for decades, in some cases centuries. And of course, some of this um, fertilizer can go into our waterways through runoff. And we saw that eutrophication extensively with the dead zones. So what can we say? Overapplied fertilizer can run off into local water bodies, infiltrate into aquifers, and evaporate into the air. And nitrates and phosphates can cause health problems. So here's another problem that can lead to soil degradation, the topic of this presentation, overgrazing. When livestock eat too much plant cover on rangelands, impeding plant regrowth, a case of grazing species exceeding its carrying capacity. So we can see here the contrast between ungrazed and overgrazed land on either side of the fence line. So can you tell which one is the overgrazed one? Well, one of these has a larger variety of native grasses. The other one, you see more bare spots. And you see these large weed, weedy type plants that have come in who can compete more effectively when the soil has been degraded. So what about overgrazing? It can set in motion a series of positive feedback loops leading to desertification. So let's take a look at this feedback loop. You have an overgrazing cow, which on this side here is removing native grasses, exposing bare topsoil, Wind and water erosion occurs, which reduces more native grass, exposing more bare topsoil. There's a positive feedback loop. Remember, think of positive feedback loop as not necessarily a positive thing, but something that creates a runaway effect. And on the other side over here, you can have overgrazing compacts the soil and damages the structure. Even just this animal walking around the soil is compacting it, and that's affecting negatively the structure of the soil. So that leads to decreased aeration. There's not as much oxygen or air getting into the soil, which is going to affect the microorganisms, and they're important for the health of the soil. So that is also decreasing grass growth and survival. It can also, by compacting it, you decrease water infiltration because it's now it's harder for the water to, to, um, to filter through it. There are fewer pores for it to travel through. And also invasive species can gain a foothold and outcompete natives in an altered environment. So what is the end of all this here? Um, we're getting decreased grass growth and survival, and decreased grass growth, decreased grass growth means less grass for the cow to graze on. So this is a positive feedback loop happening here. Okay, let's take a look at responsible grazing. What does that look like? Not all grazing is harmful. Responsible ranchers can maintain the producti productivity of their soils and grasses. So here's actually an example of where ranchers of the Malpai borderlands of Arizona and New Mexico have enlisted scientists to study their land and have concluded that prescribed fire is what's needed to restore the grasslands. And actually our own native Chumash Indians used to do this. 
they would actually occasionally burn their fields because that would help to restore some of the native grasses and native plants that they use as herbs or as medicine or as food. So most of the natives, or in fact all the natives in areas like this, are tolerant to wildfire. And a wildfire can come through, but their roots will stay alive. So the plants can then regrow. And it's nice because when these fires happen, it can burn out non-native species and things like that. And in the process of burning, you also are improving some of the nutrients of the soil um, because some of the residue left over from the burn is actually um, in good mineral form for the soil. Logging can be another um, factor in which we are degrading soil. So here we see careless forestry that has caused erosion and soil degradation. This is a situation we call clear cutting, cutting down every tree that's growing as opposed to just cutting down the mature trees. And um, you know, with that, you have more, you have less root structure, you have l um, fewer tree, um, fewer tree trunks to help slow down water as it's accelerating downhill by gravity. So you get more erosion, and we can see this erosion happening here clearly. There's a downward force bringing vegetation and soil with it. There have been some recent soil conservation laws. This is kind of FYI. This is, these are not laws that you have to know, but I'll mention them here. The U.S. has continued to pass soil conservation legislation in recent years. The Food Security Act of 1985, Conservation Resource Program, also in 1985, which pays farmers to stop cultivating highly erodible cropland, but rather to plant grasses and trees. The Freedom to Farm Act in 1996 and the Low Input Sustainable Agriculture Program in 1998. And internationally, there is the UN's FAIR or FAR program in Asia, which studies um, approaches that have worked and try to you know, disseminate that practice um, further. All right, guys, thanks for tuning in here. In summary, uh, at the end of your notes, I would like you to write a paragraph of the main concepts I presented here. And I'll see you tomorrow.